hoping to record this session. Um, if anyone wants to be off video, knowing that it's a recording, please feel free to do that. Um, but just to get to a few logistics for today's training, um, we are using Zoom, as obviously you all know. Um, I think a lot of us are really familiar with Zoom at this point, but just a few things. We do ask that you please mute yourself if you're not talking, just to limit background noise. Um, that being said, we're going to have a few times where we do like little chats, little discussions, and you're welcome to either unmute and to talk, um, or you can use the chat function, kind of whatever works best for you. Another piece, obviously, on Zoom is we all have the video, um, but as this is more of a training, really, um, you are welcome to either have your video on or off. We love seeing your faces. We love seeing your reactions to what we're talking about, but also don't feel um, obligated to keep your video on as you're listening to today's training. You will have uh, plenty of chances to ask questions questions. We want this to feel as useful as possible for you. Um, so we are going to just use that chat function. So if you think of anything as we're talking that you're like, oh, I've, I have this burning question, um, please feel free to use the chat box as we go through the training. And just a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, obviously, we're doing a little bit of welcome introductions. We're going over those housekeeping and logistics. And then we're going to take some time to talk about what detention in the United States looks like. Um, some folks may be more familiar with this or less familiar, but we do want to make sure you have a, a pretty good understanding of what that looks like and then how that looks in Connecticut. We're going to talk about the dynamics of sexual abuse that occurs behind bars. We're gonna take some time to go over the PREA standards or the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And then we're gonna take some time to talk about what reporting and investigations look like in detention so that hopefully when you start working with survivors, you can help educate them on these different things. We will have time at the end for questions. However, if you have questions throughout, we really encourage you to ask them as we go through. Don't hold them till the end, ask them as we go through. Um, but if we don't get to them, we will get to them at the end. So this is part of a training series. So we're really excited to be working with the Connecticut Alliance um, and you all to hopefully get you feeling really ready and prepared to work with incarcerated survivors. So today's sort of like that intro piece. So it's kind of setting the stage of what is sexual abuse behind bars? What rights do people have if they are sexually abused while, while they are detained? Um, but then on January 19th, we're going to, the same crew of us, Edward, Yamila, and myself, are going to really delve into how can you actually provide these services. So what does it look like if you're at a forensic exam? What tips might we be able to give you um, so that way when you're sitting there with a survivor during a forensic exam on a hotline call, responding to a letter, really those tangible tips and skills that you can use when working with incarcerated survivors. You'll notice that there are also three coaching sessions, which will be a little bit more individualized for you all to be able to have back and forth with JDI staff. And then there will be a third training on strengthening your partnerships with correction facilities. So my name is Chris Mady. I use he, he, him, or they, them pronouns. I'm a program director with Just Detention International. Um, I've been with JDI for about three and a half years, but before that, my work was at a rape crisis center. So it's always really exciting to be working with advocates, um, hearing what you all are doing, and hopefully helping you feel like, again, really ready to serve incarcerated survivors. And I'm joined today by Yamila and Edward. Hey everyone, my name is Yamila Cervantes. I use they, them, ella pronouns, and I'm JDI's newest program officer. At JDI, I primarily correspond um, with incarcerated people and I help run our programming in confinement settings. So I'm just really happy to share space with folks who might be doing some of that same work. Um, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing another Cervantes. Hi, um, I'm Edward Cervantes. We are not related, um, but we're from the same area. Uh, I am a senior program officer with JDI. Um, I answer letters, I respond to hotline calls, um, and do some workshop facilitation at uh, a couple of prisons here in California. Um, and I come to this work, or come back to this work after being in and out of jail a little bit for a while. So um, that's kind of 
my entry back um, into the work and why I care so much about um, providing services to people who are incarcerated. And the three of us work at Just Detention International or JDI for short. And if you all haven't heard of JDI, we are a health and human rights organization that seeks to end sexual abuse in all forms of detention. And we carry out our mission by working with corrections officials, rape crisis advocates, and policymakers to hopefully make detention facilities safer. We also work to promote public attitudes that value the dignity and the safety of people who are in detention. And of course, we support incarcerated survivors of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. So it's our core principle, our fundamental belief that when the government takes away someone's freedom, it takes on an absolute responsibility to protect that person's safety. Um, and that no matter what crime that someone has committed, rape is not part of the penalty. And you'll notice throughout this training, we have quotes from survivors. Um, I think that's a really integral piece of what we do here at JDI is really including the voices of survivors. Um, and so very similar to our core principle in the words of one of the survivors on our survivor council said, the assault wasn't my fault. And just because I was incarcerated, I did not deserve to be raped. So just a little bit of a note about language and the words that we choose. Uh, so we know that words have power and we wanna recognize that if we are able to change our language, that can be a starting point to changing our culture. Um, so I think it's, really important to really think about what words are we using to describe the folks we're working with. Um, so you'll see throughout this training in particular that we use the word incarcerated. Um, we don't use the word um, inmate. We don't use the word criminal. Um, we really encourage you all to also stay away from using those words. Um, so you'll hear the Department of Corrections say inmate, um, but that's really it's a pretty dehumanizing term that really takes away from someone's humanity. So just like you probably hear about person-first language in the disability field. Um, we also really encourage you to, to take that into this as well. Um, so we really encourage you to use the term incarcerated person, incarcerated survivor, um, and to stay away from more dehumanizing language. You'll also notice that we use the term survivor rather than victim. Um, and of course, we recognize that everyone uses different words to describe their own experience. Um, but throughout this training, those are the, the two words that we're really going to focus on using here. Uh, so we're all advocates. We talk about self-care all the time, um, but often we're talking about it for our clients and not necessarily for ourselves. Um, so we want to remind you all to take care of yourselves during this training, after this training. Um, we are going to show videos. We are going to talk about survivor stories. Um, and so I really want to encourage you to take deep breaths, step out as you need, turn off your video, do whatever you need to do so that you feel like you're taking care of yourself as you're attending this training. So that was a whole lot about us and JDI and what we're doing, um, but I'm just curious who is on this call. I see, you know, your little face like this big, um, but I'd love for you to just take a minute in the chat box and just let me know your first name what pronouns you use, what agency you're with, um, and what your role at the agency is. So do you help with volunteer coordination? Do you do prevention work? Do you do kind of the support groups? What do you do at your agency? I'd love to know. Um, so again, just write in the chat box your name, your pronouns, what agency you're with, and what your role at the agency is. And I'll just give folks, hi, Stephanie. Awesome. Campus advocate. Hi, Sarah. Prevention education. Fantastic. Hi, Amy. Child advocate. Fantastic. Hi, Alexa. Crisis counselor. Hey, Rachel. Hi, Jorge. Hi, Lindsay. Kayla. Linda, Kia, awesome. I'm loving all of these responses.
And I love that we have a mix. It seems like we have a mix of folks doing more prevention education type work. We also have, it looks like a couple of folks doing bilingual services, campus advocates. So a whole mix of folks. That's fantastic. Hopefully the training, especially today, will really apply to everyone because we're really, again, just sort of like setting, setting the scene and trying to hopefully kind of give you a sense of like, what is this work? What can it look like? What rights do people have? Awesome. Thank you for introducing yourself. I'm going to turn it over to Yamina, who's going to talk about detention in the U.S. Yeah, and let me know if you can hear me because my computer sounds like it's about to blow up. Okay, great. So um, yeah, in this section, we're just going to take a brief look at detention in the United States. Um, often the term detention um, is used interchangeably, right? We use it when we're referring to detention centers across the United States. But really, um, there are different kinds of facilities and they may be largely distinct from one another in terms of their size, the length of stay of the incarcerated people and their sources of funding. So these are, um, and we use the term detention really to refer to a wide range of facilities, including prisons, jails, lockups, community confinement centers, our facilities, as well as juvenile facilities and immigration facilities. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Connecticut because it has a unique detention system in the sense that it's a unified system, which means that people awaiting sentencing who are typically in jails are actually in the same facility as people who have already received their sentence. Um, and we can't talk about detention without really talking about the traumatizing nature of detention. So, um, the detention is really inherently traumatic and for everyone, not just for incarcerated survivors, although it is important to acknowledge that survivors in detention face unique barriers to healing. So people in detention settings are subjected to conditions that are really triggering, including constant surveillance, um, a lack of autonomy and privacy, a lack of control over their environment and who is in it, routine searches of, people's, uh, of people and their cell, frequent use of restraints, isolation, as well as minimal medical and mental health attention. And unfortunately, detention is not exceptional in the United States. Um, according to the Prison Policy Initiative who put this graphic together, the United States incarcerates more people per capita than any other nation. In fact, in 2020, 2.3 million people were in detention here in the United States with a majority of people in state prisons. And then um, we are also going to talk about um, who is incarcerated, right? So now that we've taken a look at where people are confined, this is who is confined. A 2013 study suggests that the majority of people who are incarcerated are men, are Black people, and are people with histories of mental illness. And obviously, there are folks who sit at the intersection of all these identities who are impacted by incarceration. Um, and like I said, uh, Black people really are sitting at, these, at this intersection, and in fact, um, Black people are incarcerated at five times the rate of white people, according to the sentencing project, and I'm going to talk about this um, more specific, with a focus on Connecticut in a second. And people who are in detention also have complex trauma histories, which include histories of child abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, gang violence, police violence, as well as um, experiences of having limited resources. There's a scholar, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who often describes um, the fact that folks are subjected to poverty, poor living conditions, and limited access to material resources as organized abandonment, which is really what a lot of folks in detention face. And so now we're gonna take a look specifically at incarceration in Connecticut. So this graph from 2018 put together by the Prison Policy Initiative gives us an understanding of where people are confined in the state. And I do want you all to keep in mind that these numbers have changed since the pandemic um, in ways that are not reflected in this chart. But the gist is that most people incarcerated in Connecticut are in state prisons. And so in short, there are three main entities that shape the landscape of detention in Connecticut, and we have them broken down here. So we have the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which oversees one detention center um, called FCI Danbury. 
And then we also have the DOC, which oversees 13 adult facilities, one youth facility, and 30 community confinement facilities. And early, earlier, if you recall, I mentioned Connecticut having a unified system, but really what does this mean, right? I'm not gonna keep you waiting because I know you're at the edge of your seat, but essentially it just means that adult facilities include pretrial detainees who are otherwise known as people waiting to be sentenced, as well as folks who have already been sentenced. And as of November 1st, uh, the DOC reported there being over 9,000 people in their system and they house over 1,000 youth between the ages of 14 and 24. And then lastly, we have the State of Connecticut Judicial Branch, and they oversee two juvenile detention centers at Bridgeport and at Hartford, and they see about 750 youth per year who have an average of a stay of 23 days. And um, I said I would discuss racial disparities in Connecticut. So here's that data. Um, the light orange bars reflect 2019 census data about the general population in Connecticut. And then the darker orange bars um, reflect 2021 um, DOC data about our incarcerated population in Connecticut. And I wanna bring to your attention the last couple of bars on this graphic. So data from the census suggests that Black people make up approximately 18% of people in Connecticut, but they make up a stark 43% of people in detention in Connecticut. Um, and similarly, Latinos make up 17% of the state's population, but 28% of the incarcerated population. And then interestingly enough, white people also make up 28% of the incarcerated population, but make up nearly 80% of the state's population. So our analysis here is not that we don't have enough incarcerated people of certain backgrounds or that people of certain backgrounds are more deviant or bad than others. Really our analysis suggests that surveillance and policing and approaches to justice works differently among um, certain racial and ethnic groups in Connecticut and that some approaches to justice tend to be more carceral than others. Sorry. And before we go to this next section real quick, I see that we have a question in the chat box um, about involuntary confinement. Uh, do you mind just sharing, Marisol, what your question is exactly about that? Sure, Jamila, one of Jamila's slides, the one that had the 14,000 versus like 1,500. There you go, you just passed it. The circle one, there you go. And then you have involuntary, oh, I'm sorry, commitment. What is that? <clears throat> Do you want me to answer this, Chris? Yeah, involuntary commitment are folks who are um, detained often against their will. So folks who have like mental illness, um, who are in psych wards and people with disabilities who are also um, believed to not be able to take care of themselves. Um, and I would just say that Connecticut has a very has very interesting laws around involuntary commitment, which is why their um, population is so little. But in other states, that tends to be a bigger piece of the pie because involuntary commitment is um, so prominent and so like rampant, essentially. Does anyone on the team want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I think just the only thing to add there is that it's via court order. Right, so it's not just like when someone has a hold at the hospital, um, it has to be extended through a court order. Um, but if you're interested in these numbers, the Prison Policy Initiative um, has some really great information that, that breaks things down state by state. Um, I really encourage you to, to check it out. It's, I think, a really kind of the best way to learn a little bit more about incarceration, kind of depending on where you wanna look in, uh, state by state or um, by the country. So that was a pretty broad overview of detention, um, as well as some like a general idea of who uh, might be in your service area that is incarcerated. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the basics of sexual abuse and we'll start off with the video. Um, and just a warning, the video is pretty intense. Um, it's a story of Rodney um, who experienced some pretty horrific abuse. So this is a time where you wanna 
take care of yourself if you need to. Um, it's a really powerful story and I think it's really important. Um, so yeah, just be aware. <laughs>